Welcome to another edition of Story Lab. I'm Jake Richmond, Senior Communications Manager for Earth Science at Goddard Space Flight Center. Today, we are joined by Dr. Wendy Bohan, and she'll be teaching us all about storytelling on social media. Social media has emerged as a cost-effective, high-impact tool for science communication and informal science education due to its broad reach, low overhead costs, and versatility. Because social media is such a popular and ubiquitous communication method, it offers the opportunity to directly interface with non-experts, improve public perception of science and scientists, and combat the growing tide of scientific misunderstanding and misinformation. However, science communication isn't as simple as an exchange of facts or knowledge. We need to connect with people's values and belief systems. One way to do that is through storytelling. Research has shown that narrative is intrinsically persuasive and is associated with increased recall, ease of comprehension, and increased audience engagement. In this talk, we'll explore potential approaches to scientific storytelling for different audiences across a suite of social media platforms from Twitter to TikTok to Instagram, exploring tips, tricks, and best practices for each. Dr. Wendy Bohan is a geologist who studies earthquakes and works to improve the communication of hazard and risk before, during, and after rapid onset geologic hazards, such as earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Her research interests include geomorphology, paleoseismology, landscape evolution, science communication, and geoscience education. She is currently the communications strategist for Code 610, the Earth Science Division at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. She's also an AAAS If Then Ambassador. She served on the Executive Leadership Board of 500 Women Scientists and is the author of the blog, Twinning at Motherhood. She's also the founder of the social media managing and consulting company, Space Face Social Media. She lives in Maryland with her husband, daughter, twin boys, and a menagerie of animals. Wendy, thank you so much for joining us. We're all looking forward to this talk. Take it away. Thanks, Jake. And you may see one of the many animals come across the screen at some point because she's asleep in a box right here behind me. So I, I wanna thank Story Lab for having me today. And that was quite an ambitious abstract that I wrote six months ago before I even came to work at NASA. And I'm gonna do what I can to get to those points, but feel free at the questions in the end to hit any of the things that I don't have time to cover because I do wanna leave a robust amount of time for questions and answers. So it's always important to make sure that we are starting uh, at the same point. Okay. So the first thing I wanna talk about is, you know, what exactly is social media to make sure we're all on the same page. We have a general idea of what it is, but the important part that I want to talk about is that it allows the creation and exchange of user generated content. There are actually six different types of so social media. We're gonna sort of talk about four. Four are the ones that we generally interact with, two are, are more video game specific. So we have collaborative projects like Wikipedia, blogs and microblogs. Those are things like Twitter content communities like YouTube and social networking sites like Facebook. Email and instant messaging are actually considered technology, so we're not talking about those things today. And I love this little graphic that gives you an idea of what some of the different social media platforms are like. So Facebook, you post things like, hey, I like coffee. Twitter, I am drinking hashtag coffee. Uh, LinkedIn, I am very good at drinking coffee. Pinterest, here's a collection of pictures and recipes of my coffee drinks. Uh, Instagram, here's a vintage photo of me drinking coffee. So lots of different types of social media platforms. So next, what about science communication? It seems self-explanatory. It is about communicating science, but it's actually the practice of informing people and educating people, which you might expect, but also sharing the wonderment of science. So we are taught as scientists that we have to be objective. Being objective does not preclude showing passion and excitement for your work, okay? We also wanna uh, raise the awareness of science-related topics. Importantly, there are multiple parts to science communication. There's always a communicator. In this case, that would be me. There's an audience. In this case, that would be you. There's a platform. 
here we're on Teams, but that could be a social media platform. It could be an actual platform, like a stage with a, a lectern, all different types of ways you can communicate science. Importantly, there are often bi-directional communication channels. So in a format like this, it can often be hard to have dialogue, but we do have the opportunity for you to ask questions at the end so we can interact in that way. I often prefer to have things where we can have a dialogue because the audience communicator link is incredibly important. Another thing to think about is that all communication is always happening within a social, emotional, and physical context, which is coloring how the information that we're communicating is received. In 2017, the National Academy for Science, Engineering, and Medicine put out uh, a paper uh, called Communicating Science Effectively, and it outlined five science communication goals. The first, we've discussed sharing the findings and excitement of science. The second goal was to increase appreciation for science as a way of understanding and navigating through the world, using evidence to make good choices. The third goal was to increase knowledge related to a specific issue that requires a decision. I call this science activation. How do we actually apply the scientific knowledge that we have? We often think of this in terms of lawmakers and policymakers, community leaders, uh, using science-based information to make good decisions. The fourth goal sounds a little bit nefarious, but it's not. It's using science to influence people's opinions and behaviors when the weight of evidence is overwhelming. This is something like, we need to tell people not to smoke because smoking causes cancer. Wearing masks can stop the transmission of communicable diseases, that sort of thing. The fifth goal is to engage with diverse groups. Now, why is this a goal of science communication? Because if we're going to do good science, we have to be asking the right questions. If we only have one type of person, one group of people that are asking these questions, we may not be asking the right questions, which means we're not gonna get the right answers. In today's world, where we have global issues that are confronting our earth, our societies, we need to have a variety of perspectives involved, which means we have to bring everyone into the scientific discussion and get those diverse views from lots of different groups. So what are some of the challenges? of communicating science. Well, many people have a lingering dislike of science from you know, past experiences. Maybe they had a really boring science teacher in high school or they weren't good at science, but there's also a real lack of familiarity with science and science topics. Almost 40% of American adults have not taken a science class since high school. There have been a lot of advances that have happened. So that lack of familiarity can become a barrier to understanding. We've seen that there can be a lack of trust with science and scientists. We're gonna address that. There's also a lot of influences that our audiences are under. Psychological, political, societal, cultural, economic, moral, religious, institutional influences that again, are gonna change the way they're able to receive the information that we are communicating. Also, just the nature of science itself makes it difficult for people outside of the scientific establishment to sometimes understand. There's a lot of inherent uncertainty in science. Also, we actually change our conclusions when we have more data, which is not something that you always see in day-to-day -day society, right? Science is a process. So I thought this illustrated that last point really well. This is a tweet from BBC Radio that says, my concern is that we just keep making this up as we go along. The government needs to get a grip on our scientists. How can the science change from one day to the next? So that to me demonstrates a funda fundamental misunderstanding of the scientific process, that more data can lead to changing conclusions. Not that we were wrong, just that we didn't have all of the information that we have now. We have confronted this, these challenges in the past through something called the deficit model. And the idea behind the deficit model is that if people just had all of the facts, all of the evidence, then they would come to the same conclusions that we have come to as scientists, right? But unfortunately, decades and decades of work have shown that the deficit model alone does not work, particularly when we're talking about things like climate change, evolution, the shape and age of the earth, gender diversity and inclusion, anything that kind of falls under the hat of potential conspiracy theories can be really difficult to address just through factual information. Why is that? Well, that's because people don't actually make decisions solely based on evidence and facts. 
Values and belief systems shape the decisions that we make, particularly religion and political affiliation. And political and religious identity are directly correlated with beliefs about stem cell research, the Big Bang and evolution, and political identity directly correlates with people's beliefs about climate change. Okay, so what even is a belief? So a belief is an idea that you hold to be true. And our beliefs are shaped through a myriad of different influences like our culture, our faith, education, experience, our mentors, the people that we know, the groups that we consider ourselves to be a part of. Our beliefs help to shape our values. I call values um, measuring sticks. It's the things that are important to you. It could be happiness or wealth. It could be family, career success, lots of different measuring sticks or values. That leads into your attitudes and your attitudes are what help shape your behavior, how you act. As a hazard scientist, I spend a lot of time thinking about how we can change people's behaviors to make sure that they're using evidence to make good choices during potentially risky situations. So how can we do that? If we have to connect to people's values and belief systems, like how, what is the path forward? I think one way we can approach it is through the behavioral psychology model uh, suite. And this is a model called the elephant and the rider. And the idea here is that everyone has a rider. That is our analytical, rational side. As scientists, we really strongly identify with our rider. But everyone also has an emotional, irrational side, which we're going to call the elephant. Perched atop the elephant, the rider holds the reins and seems to be the leader. But the rider's control is actually kind of precarious because the rider is so small relative to the elephant. So I want you to think of a time where you made a decision that wasn't actually based on facts, not really an analytical or rational decision. Do you have three kids, but you bought a Jeep Wrangler because you just loved it? Or maybe, you know, you stayed up too late with your friends, even though you had a big presentation. I'm not saying that was me, could have been. But we all make decisions based on our elephant sometimes, right? So how can we actually use this to think about behavioral change? The first thing, we have to direct the rider. We have to give clear direction to help reduce mental paralysis. So instead of saying something like, you know, eat better, say eat more leafy greens or eat less sugar. And this is where we're gonna spend a lot of time. We have to motivate the elephant. We have to find the emotional connection to people. We also wanna shape the path reduce obstacles, make it easy for people to change their mind. It is terrible to be wrong. It, I hate being wrong and I'm wrong all the time. So that's tough. You get used to it. We can work to make it easier for people to say, wow, you know what? I was mistaken and I see your point. So there's lots of different ways that, that we can do that and we can discuss that later. So how can we actually motivate the elephant? How can we find emotional connection with our audiences. One of the great ways to do that is through scientific storytelling. Research shows us that narratives are intrinsically persuasive and they're associated with increased recall, increased ease of comprehension and increased engagement. So I really love this quote from Dahlstrom that says, the plural of anecdote is not data, but anecdote has a greater chance of reaching and engaging non-experts. So if we want people to really find connection with what we're saying we need to approach what we're talking about in different ways. I think a really great way to find connection and tell our stories is through social media. And so what are some other ways besides the ones I just outlined that that tell us that social media is a, is a really good um, path forward for us as science communicators? Well, first, there's about 8 billion people in the world and almost 60% of them are active social media users. Okay, that's a lot of people. We have potential access to more than half the population of the world. We could talk science to more than half the population of the world. Now, I want you to think how or write even in the chat if you're interested. How long do you think worldwide people spend on social media every day? And remember, that's not like Google or Amazon or online shopping. That's like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. How long do you think? And do you think that's more or less time than the average American spends every day? 
So worldwide average is around two and a half hours a day. And that's slightly more than the U.S. average, which is around two hours and 15 minutes. Uh, the Philippines and Nigeria keep going back and forth for the top spot. More than four hours a day people spend on social networking sites. So we have a huge potential audience of people to talk to about science and they are online a lot. So there's a lot of opportunity to talk to them. Additionally, if we bring this back around to uh, America, the United States, most Americans have at least some interest in science news and one third of social media users see those platforms as an important way that they get science news. So that's really important. Also, 47% of news consumers who rely on two or more social uh, media sites for news are non-white, including Hispanics, and 77% are age 18 to 46. So we have lots of different demographics in the United States that we can reach through social media sites to talk about science. But only about a quarter of social media users trust the science posts that they see on social media. I would argue that this is good because we want people to be at least a, a little bit hesitant about just believing what they read, right? We want them to have some discerning element about whether or not this is a trustworthy source. So that brings me to the point, what if scientists were the ones actually posting the science? But that brings up the idea that do people actually trust scientists? Here's a... Um, Sorry, here's a survey from, from Nature about organizations and the amount of trust that people have in them. So scientists, the military, religious leaders, the news media, and elected officials. There's two pieces of good news here. The first is that scientists and the military both have similar amounts of trust. We rank above religious leaders, the news media, and elected officials. The other piece of good news is that trust in scientists has actually increased between 2016 and 2019. The bad news is that even with that increase, less than like 40% of the people that were surveyed have a great deal of trust in scientists. So we have a lot of work that we can do to build more trust. Sorry, I'm, there we go. This part is really especially interesting to me because I wanna flip the framing a little bit. If we think about science communication and putting out science information as like advertising for science, let's just think about it in that frame for a second. So having some people want to trust sources, right? Who do they trust though? If we're thinking about science as advertising, we're looking at this source from the Nielsen company, people trust recommendations from people that they know 90% of the time, right? People also desire a personal connection with their news. So they desire a personal connection with their news sources. They're getting news from social media. They want to see science on social media and they trust recommendations from people that they know. And scientists are actually already using social media. Between 75 and 80% of academic researchers already use social media. So that means you basically know the people on your social networks, right? Which means that they probably trust you. And so they will consider your recommendations more highly than they would people that they don't know. And they wanna see science news and they're already on social media, but we're not actually as scientists posting about science. We're missing a huge opportunity here. And importantly, scientists have networks that are populated largely by non-scientists. And especially with early career scientists, these networks are often ideologically and politically diverse. That means that we can talk to people with lots of different values and belief systems on our social networking sites. These are people that, again, already trust us because they know us. This is a graphic from Baskey et al, 2015, and it's showing the proportion of links to friends of different ideological affiliations for liberal, moderate, and conservative Facebook users. So it just shows the distribution of political affiliations across people's different Facebooks. So this is the part, if we were live, everybody would go, mm-mm, no, like that sounds good, but I'm not arguing with people online. Like that doesn't work. I'm not going to bother. It just irritates me. Like I hear you. I agree. And work by Messing and Westwood shows that passive exposure to new information can actually change public perceptions and their behavior. And this is backed up by work by Karen Kirk, who was one of my friends. She's a, a science writer for NASA now. So woo, Karen. But she is a a brave researcher. She has gone into some of the deep, dark parts of the internet 
to study people's perceptions about climate change. And so she was in a Reddit thread uh, of people that used to believe climate change was a hoax and they had their minds changed. And so she wanted to understand what it was that changed their minds. And she summed it up in this slide. There was a, a quote from a, a person that she thought kind of summed up a lot of the, the sentiments that were expressed there. Repeated exposure to overwhelming evidence of climate change, partially thanks to persistent posters on Facebook, finally got through to me. And so she's saying facts don't change people's minds, huh? So basically that's uh, the deficit model, right? They do, but not in exclusion. We can't just give people facts. We also have to give people facts in ways that they can receive that. So facts are not gonna change people's minds immediately. It's not always gonna work. The facts have to be relevant to what they're interested in. They have to be from the right source and they have to be delivered respectfully, right? Like just in general, if we treat people with respect, that's gonna take us a long way forward. Okay, so where, where can we actually do this work? And this is sort of a, a tips and tricks of how to get started on any social media platform. So first, you wanna figure out your platforms. We already talked about how there's six different types of social media. I've put them on the left for reference. And I just really love this vintage social media cartoon because it gives you an idea of what these different networks are used for. So YouTube, you know, is videos. You can look at videos. It's like what you used to look at out the window. Pinterest is a place where you pin things like recipes or ideas or, you know, things for a birthday party just things that you don't wanna lose, you're gonna put them somewhere. LinkedIn, for instance, would be the old Rolodex. It's your professional contacts. You contrast this to Facebook, which was your old address book. Those are your personal contacts, uh, contacts and so on like that. So those are the platforms. I've lost my forward button. This is a wonderful graphic from AGU Sharing Science that is giving you additional information about different platforms, along with how much time it takes, the length of each post that's expected, whether or not it uses images, what the audience is and what the age is of that audience. So across the top, we have Twitter, which is a micro blog, 280 characters in each post or less. Tumblr is a, a smaller blog site. Then we have Instagram, which is mainly posting pictures, Facebook, pretty much everybody knows Facebook. And this is WordPress, which is a traditional blogging site. So the time it takes to produce the actual content for each of those is different because mainly the length of the post, etc. So if you want to get started, this is an excellent place to start. Let's break it down. Any type of communication you do, really ever, the first thing you need to think about is who is your audience? Who are you trying to talk to? And think broadly. You can have multiple audiences, but you want to try and be specific because that's going to give you guardrails to help give you some direction. Next, what is your objective? What are you trying to do? And you can have different objectives for each audience and your objectives can be broad or they can be very specific. So once you've identified those, you start by determining the platform you wanna use. So if you're interested in talking to 13 to 18 year olds, you're gonna to wanna to get on TikTok, Instagram, or Snapchat because you're not gonna find that age group on, for instance, Facebook. But if you wanna to talk to people that are uh, interested in certain political issues, often, the Facebook demographic is gonna be the one that you want. So that's one way you can choose your platform. Additionally, if you're already on a platform and familiar with that platform, you might just wanna go ahead and use that one to, to sort of dip your toes into the water and get yourself going. It's a smaller activation energy, right? The first thing after you've picked your platform is find people to follow on that platform. People you already know, people you respect, people you're interested in learning more about. Find organizations to follow. Might I suggest NASA Goddard as an excellent organization to follow? And then jump into conversations. Social media is inherently social. It's a conversation. It's a dialogue, right? That two-way communication channel. So you really want to participate in these conversations. But you don't have to be the one creating the content all the time. You can amplify others. You want to be careful with who you amplify because really you only want to put forward really good information, trustworthy people like you do in, in regular life. So then, okay, what do you post? And this is where a lot of people get stuck. They're like, oh, what do I say? What do I say? Say whatever. It's based on your audience and objectives. So let that be your starting point. And again, you can create your own content or share the content of others. And then just find your unique voice. Talk about the things that you think are important. And I would advocate 
for a mix of science and personal information. Not like your credit card number or your social security, not that kind of personal. But I think it's very important that we humanize scientists. Why? Because people trust the people that they know. So if people feel like they know you, they're going to be much more willing to trust and believe what you have to say. Two thirds of Americans in 2011 could not name a living scientist. Of the people who could name a living scientist, 15% named Stephen Hawking. So I don't know what the percentage is now, but I think it's, it's pretty low. We want to make sure that more and more people can actually name scientists, can know who scientists are and what they're doing, can identify with them, can identify with their passion and the joy that they may get from their work, right? And so that will help to improve how people feel about scientists and science kind of writ large, right? So how do you know what to share? That's another big question I get all the time. How much is too much? I don't want to put too much out there. The line is different for everyone. And I say to use the holiday party test. You know, at your organization, usually there's some kind of holiday party. And it's a little less formal than a normal professional work day, right? You know, you can loosen your tie and kick off your shoes, keep your buttons buttoned all the time. Buttons should be buttoned. You know, just want to put that out there. You want to be polite. You want to be professional. Never use profanity. But you can be yourself. Be irreverent. Be funny. You know, tell people how you hate the Raiders and you love the Dodgers and you have a cat sleeping in a box right next to you. You know, little tidbits about your life so people can say, hey, you know what? That person is a scientist, but they're just like me. All right, I'll get off my soapbox. Here's the other thing people always say. Oh, I'm so busy. I get it. I am also busy. And I spend my life in this graphic, right? <laughs> Trying to reach my life goals and getting sidelined by the Internet. But it doesn't have to take a lot of time. And like most things, the, the load is often in the front. So allow one to two hours up front to get everything set up. And then you just have to maintain it. I maintain over coffee breaks, right? So depending on how much coffee you drink, I guess that could be a lot of time. But five minutes a day, say, to check, maybe write something, send it out. If there's a, a new interesting study that you're putting out, put that out there. There's information data that shows that people that post their papers online actually have more citations than people who don't. So, you know, there can be professional reasons to post your, your data and information in terms of uh, your scientific work. Once in a while, you want to spend some extra time looking for new contacts and thinking about your messaging. But that's all the time you have to take. It does not have to take over your entire life. So I'm going to switch a little bit into hazards now. Okay. So in hazards, when social media came on the scene, it really changed things in sometimes not very good ways. So I want to go through that a little bit just to acknowledge that these issues are there and that we're working on them. So when social media became a thing, it really changed the public's expectations of how much we were going to information about the hazards and the events that we were going to release and the time frame over which that happened, right? And it changed it in three ways, I think. It changed the time scale over which information is expected to be disseminated, the role of the traditional media as information gatekeepers, and experts who are communicating with the public. So let me break that down a little bit. First, and I'm going to put this in the context of earthquakes since that is my science, but um, I was at the USGS at Caltech there would be an earthquake somewhere. And in about 30 minutes, there would be news vans parked outside, sometimes 20 minutes. And they were seeking experts to talk to. Here's an image of Lucy Jones, uh, Southern California earthquake lady. And that's her, her son. One of the earthquakes happened in the middle of the night. She and her husband are both seismologists. That's how that picture happened. But now, because of social media, people expect an immediate release of information and real-time updates. And truly, organizations that are tasked with putting that information out are often not able to respond in that time frame. This creates frustration with the public, and it can actually create an information void. So here is a tweet from uh, Last Quake that says, there are very few scientific organizations active on social media after damaging earthquakes. That's a complaint we've been receiving. There's nobody to answer our questions. The media role has also changed. So before there was social media, the traditional media, like you know, newspapers and television and radio, they were the information gatekeepers and all information and reporting came from them. But now, 
anybody can report information on social media and the media get much of their information from social media. So this is a quote from Forbes that uh, came after the, I don't remember what year, it was a few years ago, earthquake in Alaska. Judging by the images and testimonies being shared on social media, infrastructure damage is widespread. Finally, expertise. Okay, before social media, the experts were largely predetermined by the media and the agencies like the USGS or FEMA were responsible for disseminating that information and they were the focus of the media. Now, anybody can report information on social media, which makes it really hard for people to determine expertise because people may sound like they know what they're talking about, but actually not have the knowledge or credentials to be saying those things. This leads to a spread of misinformation speculation, and really bad advice. So we have some uh, images down here of things that come out fairly regularly. Earthquake warning, ground splitting earthquake predicted, or seismic silence, be ready for large activity. This causes a lot of anxiety with people, okay? What all of these things together have the potential to do is create an equation for a communication disaster. So you have a change in the expectation of time, which creates that information void. You add that to the traditional media role change, which creates confusion about who an expert is. And that leads to the propagation of damaging misinformation. So what can we do about that? There's a lot of potential paths forward. These are just a few ideas. The first thing we can do is train scientists to communicate. Generally, scientists are not trained to communicate, and the way we are taught to communicate is antithetical to good communication practice. So we need to train people to be able to talk to lots of different audiences. One of the things we can do in hazards is to produce best practice documents. So when we train scientists to talk about the hazard or the ongoing risk that people are experiencing, they're all doing it in a consistent way, okay? In order to create that best practice document, we have to have collaborations between agencies and academic scientists. Because the agencies aren't able to respond in that time frame, we have the potential for the academic or individual scientists to come in and fill that gap so we can get rid of the information void. Additionally, we have to have a collaboration between hazard scientists and social scientists. Why? because we have to improve scientists' empathetic response to hazard communication, because this has been shown to be critical for persuasive risk communication. Empathy? But we were taught to be objective. This is too much feelings. Why empathy? Like, oh, that can be really uncomfortable, right? Again, when people are experiencing a hazard, like an earthquake, an oncoming tsunami, a, a volcano is about to erupt, that is a high stress situation. Okay, and in order for them to believe what you're telling them and trust the science, they have to trust the messenger and trust in high stress situations is assessed in the first nine to 30 seconds. All right. And the lion's share of whether or not you are deemed as trustworthy is based on how caring, empathetic and compassionate you seem. Additionally, honesty and openness, your intention is another big chunk of that pie, okay? Your competency or expertise to talk about the issue at hand is only 15 to 20%. So empathy, how we get our messages out are critical. And this slide right here is the tension in which I live my life. So I have a cat meowing here, excuse me one sec. Okay, kitty. This is the menagerie of animals, right? How do we get people to understand the threat and take the threat seriously, but not be paralyzed by fear, right? I have to communicate compassion and empathy, but I also have to give people a message that really may not be what they wanna hear. You will continue to feel earthquakes for an indefinite period of time. There could be a bigger earthquake coming. So how, how can we do this in a way that gives people agency and doesn't make them shut down? So a lot of that is gonna be based on messaging. We need to be clear with our messaging it has to be simple, not jargony, you know, make it as clear as possible. We have to be consistent and that's not just internally consistent. We have to be consistent across all of the different messengers, across all of the different potential platforms, which is why we need that best practices document, right? We have to make sure that everyone is consistent in what they're saying. 
has to be timely. You have to give people the information they need in a time frame over which they can use it. It's got to be audience appropriate. Again, in any kind of communication, you have to consider your audience. After a big earthquake or a volcanic eruption, the way that you talk to an elementary student versus the way you talk to a community leader needs to be different. And the messenger does matter. There's still this competency and expertise piece, but you need to remember that people don't care what you know until they know that you care. Another thing we have to think about when we're presenting hazards information to people is the actual psychology of risk perception. The first thing that we as human beings do is simplify messages, okay? It's called heuristics. Like we are very mentally lazy. We have so much information coming at us all the time that we have to simplify it down and figure out what's important and what's not important. So we don't wanna give people messages that are too complex because they're gonna simplify it and potentially add in misinformation or misunderstanding. Another thing to recognize, we hold on to our current beliefs. Again, this is our value and belief structure. The information we're receiving is being fit into a framework that is our cultural values, belief systems, understandings, okay? This to me, number four is probably the most important. We believe the first message that we hear. That is the message against which we measure all other messages. And so it is very important to get messages out in a timely way. That's like half the battle. Once we've heard that first message, we look for additional information and opinions. Now, we tend to give more credence to information and opinions that meet that first message content, right? Cherry picking. So it's very important to be that first message. And again, talking about uh, importance of messaging, the things we have to tell people, especially during hazard situations, the stories that we need them to construct have to come up with these three pieces. The information that communicates why the situation applies to the person. So anytime I give a talk about earthquakes, my storytelling about that starts with, did you know in your area there was an earthquake in this time? And this is what happened. And this is how people were affected. Why does it matter to you? Make it personal to the listener. An explanation of why that information is known. That's the science behind it. Then I start the story of, we knew this earthquake happened here. This is how it affected your community. This is what we've learned. This is the fault it occurred on. This is how many earthquakes have been there. This is how the soil where you are responds. Here's the science. And then you have to give them the agency because that can be really scary. Oh my God, there was an earthquake here. Are you kidding me? What am I gonna do? Here's what you do, right? These are the things you can do in your house or your apartment for your family, at your school, at your job to make yourself safer. Okay, so we bring in the storytelling, we bring in the humanization, we bring in the place-based um, knowledge of where the people may be, and then we make sure that we're empathetic about the entire situation. There's a lot to it. Really what it comes down to is talking to people like they're people, because they are. That's the whole point, and that's what social media allows you to do. So to review, facts aren't enough. We have to connect to people's values and belief systems. We can do that through things like storytelling, humanizing scientists, and building trust across networks. And one of the great ways that we can do all of those things is through social media. So thank you for your attention. Right on 40 minutes. So that means we do have a robust uh, question and answer period time. Here's my email and my website if you're interested. And of course, surprise, you can find me on social media, all the different things. So. I will stop presenting and um, take any any questions that that you might have. Thank you, Wendy. That was awesome. Um, I know I have a couple of questions for you, um, but before we get to that, I just want to remind the audience we do have about 20 minutes left in the talk. So please go ahead and mm -hmm. throw your questions in the chat. Uh, we will have time for several, but I will, I'll start with one of mine. Um, so you've been doing this for a long time, Wendy, and obviously your results speak for themselves. Um, there are lots of great anecdotes and references to some of the work you've done in the past with, with earthquakes, et cetera. But as I'm curious, your thoughts about as social media itself has evolved as, um, 
there are changes being made to how content gets fed to people with with algorithms and you know increased values on engagement have you seen your tactics have to evolve along with that and if so how absolutely thank you for that question jake and that feeds into something that i also think a lot about which is how we measure social media effectiveness and um, for those of you who are not as familiar with social media, all the different social media platforms have different algorithms that they use to give you information um, and to, to see how people are going to be given information. And so that's how posts go viral. You know what I mean? Like somebody will think this is really interesting. The algorithm pushes it up because people are engaging. Lots of people are viewing and then it kind of, you know, hits a critical threshold and it goes to millions of people. So algorithms change all the time which means that you have to be constantly thinking about turning these different knobs. So if you are a, a regular scientist, you're putting out information, your goal on social media, let's say you're on Twitter, is to interface with other scientists to learn more about your research field, to meet up with people at meetings, and to put out uh, your research findings. The algorithm isn't actually going to matter that much to you, right? Because you can develop those communities on your own and you're not really trying to grow a larger community. If you're thinking about, say, interfacing more with the public, you want as broad a reach as you possibly can. And in that case, you have to think about things like, does when is my audience online? You know, Are these teachers who are not gonna be online during the normal workday because they're in front of the classroom? They're more likely to be engaged in the evening. And then you can test that theory by you know, posting similar things at different times or across different platforms. So yes, absolutely. As social media evolves and as the algorithms change, you have to be mindful and watchful of how the engagement with different posts changes. And you get a sense for that over time and you can adjust as needed. I actually have a paper coming out in science communication on uh, TikTok. So we, we did an assessment of this on TikTok. So if anybody's interested. Thank you. All right. So kind of similarly um, from Nissa Rain, we have a question. Oh, looks like you guys know, know each other. She says, how can we as science communicators combat the quote unquote bad actors, also known as those who are purposely putting out misinformation for nefarious reasons? Good luck with that one. Well, yeah, so there's two types of things here. There's misinformation and disinformation. Misinformation is incorrect information that people are putting out potentially unintentionally, like not knowing that it's bad information or they're sharing things from a bad source, but there's no ill intent. Disinformation is these bad actors where they're putting things out intentionally that they know are wrong that may be clickbait, they may be trying to sell something, they may be trying to just grow their platform and they don't care about what they're doing. This is really difficult because there are two different schools of thought here in terms of science communication. One is called vaccination. <laughs> so you, all of these people generally follow similar storylines. And so instead of waiting for them to put out bad information, you put out the counter information first. So whenever there's a big earthquake that comes that happens anywhere, I say no one can predict earthquakes and anyone who says differently is selling something. That way, that's the first message people hear. So when somebody goes, well, there was a big earthquake in Sumatra, which means there's going to be a huge San Andreas event tomorrow. People are like, mm, but I heard that Wendy said that that was not that you couldn't do that. The other thing you can do is ignore them. Right. We don't really ever sometimes you want to engage like it's such a fine line you don't want to draw attention to it you don't want to give them more attention and more followers and more engagement because that will engage the algorithm to push them out to more people and at the same time sometimes by combating the misinformation directly you're talking to what we call the fence sitters the people that are listening but they haven't made up their mind yet and so People will approach it different ways. I approach it situa situationally, and generally I tend to vaccinate and ignore. But that's just because I cannot, and I encourage all of you to take this stance, I am not going to put my time, my mental health, and my energy into that kind of thing, right? I want to give people good information, which is why the vaccination part, right? I want to spend my energy doing good things, not 
arguing with people that have bad intentions? It's a great question, Nissa. All right, we have another one from Jessica Evans. I know Jessica. Hello, Jessica. Um, Wendy, thank you so much for presenting to us today. I work in social media and I still learned so much. And a smiley face. In your work, do you find it helpful to stay attuned to trends such as trending video, audio formats, trending hashtags, new technology, etc., and adapt your message to what is trending? Or as a science communicator, do you prefer to stick to what's tried and true? Thank you so much. Thanks for the question, Jessica. I think it's a mix and it also is platform dependent. So on Facebook, I tend not to do any kind of staying tuned to any trends um, because the demographic that that appeals to is really not up on trends. <laughs> so for TikTok, I, I do a lot of trends because that's going to push you up in the algorithm, right? On Twitter, I will do a mix. I tend to have the topics that I talk about, but I will do things uh, when I was running, you know, a, an organizational social media account about earthquakes, I would often put up for, cause there's a hashtag called motivational Mondays that some people look at. And I would be like, you can save a thousand dollars now for every dollar you put in later. If you do earthquake engineering on your home and bolt it to the foundation, motivational Monday for getting the things done, right? Like trying to fit the message in other places. So, I mean, it's a mix and platform dependent, I think. Agreed. Okay. Now we have a question from Ryan S. Um, he says, according to someone he trusts on Facebook, because they actually included a link to the Maryland Geological Survey, there was apparently an earthquake just before midnight last night in Sykesville, Maryland. And I'm curious if you were aware of that. I am looking it up right now. You can look it up too. If you go to Station Monitor from IRIS, I R I S, you can actually see live feeds of seismometers all around the world. And so I didn't know there was an earthquake in Maryland, but it wouldn't be weird. There's lots of earthquakes in Maryland. We don't generally feel them unless we're nearby. So here's one and it is, yeah, it was a magnitude two. So yeah. There you go, everybody. Real time geologic science happening in front of your eyes. <laughs> okay, uh, next question is from Ronnie. Hello, Ronnie. Um, she asks, female and minority scientists seem to be harassed more online. How do you or how have you protected yourself from that kind of harassment, you know, as active as you've been on social media in your career? Yeah, there's a lot of harassment. And if people choose to not be online for that reason, it is absolutely understandable. I tend to block liberally. People are not, when I'm doing something in my free time, people are not entitled to my time, my attention or my engagement. And so if, if people come at me in a way that I find disrespectful, I always give one try because tone can be hard. You know, we all mess up sometimes. And if I have two bad interactions in a row, see you later. Um, people sliding into your DMs is problematic, but again, I don't open, I just, you know, delete and block. Um, having a community of supportive people can also be really helpful. If you work for an organizational website, having somebody you can hand off to can be helpful. Um, oh, I had another point. I have had to get the FBI involved with some interactions, so that is an option. If there should be death threats or threats of sexual violence, they will come and, and handle the situation, which is not preferable, but it happens. It's tough. It's tough. Block liberally. Yeah, not a super easy answer, but great question. Um, okay, so Hannah R is next. She says, very helpful presentation, Wendy. My question is, how do you recommend building credibility as a young science communicator? And I'll just sort of add to that. Um, it does remind me a bit of my first question, which is how to deal with the algorithms that just continuously prioritize engaging posts, which is another way of saying really interesting posts, which is another way of saying posts that might tend toward extremes. And for someone who's just starting on social media, who is trying to build a following where people are actually paying attention, um, that can be a longer process than people realize and may not be patient about it. Um, so for anyone who is starting out, uh, especially as a young person, what are your tips for, for getting that started? 
the first thing that you want to do is start to follow people that are important in your field that have strong voices on social media start to follow them start to post information on your own and so your credibility just like everything else just like trust it's built over time so to jake's point you have to set appropriate expectations because it's going to take a while to build a big following but starting conversations with people in your field that are knowledgeable where you can contribute gets you on their radar and they will start to react to you and interact with you which then other people that they are following or you know are kind of networked with will see that and they'll be like oh hey they're talking to this person they have good interactions i'm going to follow them too and so you start to build out that way and because you are interacting in meaningful ways you're contributing in meaningful ways to the conversation and because you're working with and interacting with lots of people on this particular subject that's just how you build it day by day layer by layer so you know it's a process i have a whole talk on how to build you know social media platforms that we can i'm happy to you know do that for anybody whenever so we can do that too but there's lots of different tips and tricks for community building um if you're interested in building credibility as a young science communicator, you can't just do it on social media. You also have to have other things that you're doing. So a blog, for instance. Love it. Uh, great advice. Also, Jacob Reed, uh, another gentleman with the perfect first name, and I happen to know him. Hello, Jacob. You mentioned, Wendy, timeliness is important. So what do you see as nasa's role on social media immediately after a disaster strikes specifically is this an appropriate time to share the science behind the disaster when lives are in jeopardy that is such a critical question jacob thank you for asking that and we've actually addressed that in the best practices social media document that we've been working on with the usgs not me so much as some of my colleagues at michigan but um one of the, there's there's all of these individual things is it the time to put out science yes it depends on how esoteric the science is maybe that's not the time to go into great depth about how you know the insar works <laughs> you know that's not the time but in the immediate aftermath of what's happening people are looking for information there may not be a lot of information about exactly what happened and this is the kind of information that can help fill that void right the earthquake happened or the tsunami happened and this is how we can measure it this is how we know what happened so you're giving people an understanding of the science that's used to get them critical information which builds trust you do want to make sure to stay off the emergency management hashtags so every disaster will have a hashtag you just have to search for a little bit to find that do not use that to share science because that needs to be kept for the people that are on the ground dealing with the immediate aftermath and the emergency responders that are responding to the disaster. But I think it is absolutely, you know, a good idea to start sharing science about what is happening and why it's happening and how we know. Thank you. Uh, that's another great tip, staying off those hashtags. Uh, not sure that's something that has crossed my mind, but we do deal with disasters quite a bit, as you know, at NASA with several social accounts and partner agencies involved, et cetera. All right. So um, I think we have time for about one more question, and it's um, something that uh, you and I will be working together on. It's also something that Ronnie mentioned uh, in one of her comments in the chat earlier, but just about any any recommendations for those who are listening right now a lot of us communicators who deal with scientists directly um either large scale small scale interactions but tips for those of us who will be interacting with scientists and will be in some form training them or how to interact online generally um please share so i think um the one of the first things that we have to keep in mind once we've determined our audience and our objective is to remember that we're talking to people real people just like us and we have to communicate to them that we are also real people just like them we lose that sometimes in the the translation um so bringing in that humanizing element when we have as scientists our entire careers had that like beaten out of us by the objectivity stick right we we can set aside 
that objectivity, not when we're doing our science, but when we are discussing our passion for it and the need for it and why we've spent our entire lives doing this thing. Like that's a commitment and we did it for a reason and it's okay to share that. Um, and so I also think that it's important to be open to new platforms and ideas. So there's a question here from Michelle about what platform will be the next big thing. You know, we get in a rut about how we share our science. We do it the same way. We've come up with a formula that works and that's great. But I would argue that 20 to 25% of your content has to be pushing boundaries. You have to be trying new things, whether that's something like a, a new thing on an old platform like Facebook Live or whether that's a new thing altogether. For many of us, that was TikTok, you know, and I understand that's problematic for government organizations for a whole myriad of reasons, but video is where things are going, right? And we have all these things at our fingertips that allow us to make really high quality video content with very little, you know, additional hurdles. And so I think really leaning in to, to some of the new technologies and making sure that we know where the audiences are. We can't expect people to come to us for content. How do they even know what we're trying to say? We have to meet people where they are. Maybe that's in the pub at a science salon. Maybe that's on a social media, brand new social media platform where all the middle school girls are going. Maybe that's, you know, we wanna talk to our, our heavy voter uh, population and that's gonna be on a Facebook Live. So very dependent, but making sure that you are nimble and agile also important. Great, thank you. And and sincerely, Dr. Bohan, it has been a pleasure learning from you today. I know I can speak for a lot of our colleagues, both inside and outside the communication sphere, but personally, it's been a pleasure to get to know you already in your new tenure here at NASA. I'm really looking forward to the privilege of working with you more in the future. You are uh, clearly a great asset to Goddard and we're glad to have you on board. And just thanks for taking time and, and sharing what you've learned for a bunch of people who are ready to take it and apply it. All right, thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. All right, well, thanks everyone for tuning in to another Story Lab. That'll do it. I hope you guys have a, a nice rest of your Wednesday.